Hi, thanks for having having me. My name is Dorothy Zinn. Um, I'm a former home care pharmacist. So we know that medication non-adherence leads to significant associated health care costs every single year, and one of the interventions that health care providers often turn to to address this problem is the use of compliance or adherence packaging. But as a former home care pharmacist who's seen many, many patients struggle with an intervention that was really intended to help, my goal today is really to create an awareness that for some, compliance packaging is not the answer as many believe it to be. So over the next 10 minutes or so, um, we're going to take a look at some of the more common compliance aids that community pharmacies um, have used with their patients and also share a couple of patient stories to highlight the limitations of this particular intervention and, and as well also to identify characteristics of good and poor candidates for compliance packaging. For many individuals, try to manage, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve medications a day, or even a few medications taken three or four times a day, this process is, is very overwhelming and for many it becomes a daily struggle. In compliance packaging, it's really intended to help patients be able to safely self-manage their own medications as prescribed. So I'm not going to delve into the details about medication adherence, but really there needs to be a recognition that adherence issues are multifactorial and that compliance packaging really only addresses patient and therapy related aspects such as patient cognition and complex medication regimens. For example, the cost of medications is a major factor that is frequently cited as a deterrent to filling prescriptions or to even continuing medication therapy. Packaging a patient's medication in compliance packaging does nothing to address this particular concern. So some of you might recognize some of the products found in this, these, this picture or this slide. Um, your patients might be using one of them. Um, these are the com common compliance packaging aids that are often prepared by community pharmacies. And there's lots of different types, and each of them have their own advantage and disadvantage. Um, I speak Canada's e-learning module um, on the medication safety considerations of compliance packaging highlights the different aids and their, different, their pros and cons uh, in a little bit more detail. But what I want to share with you just is sort of a brief overview of the different types. So if you take a look at the um, center bottom picture, so this is an example of a blister pack. It's very common, commonly found in community pharmacy. Um, for those who aren't familiar with this particular product, um, there are four columns, and each column is represented by a time of day. So typically breakfast, lunch, supper, um, and bedtime. And there are seven rows in a, in a sort of in a pack, and each row is represented by a day of the week. And so what a patient needs to do is take a look at, um, figure out what day it is, what time of day it is, and pop up the medications in that particular blister and take those medications. To the left of that, there is in the green, um, back, with the green background, there's another type of uh, blister packaging. This one's a little bit different. It's not foil-backed. It's got a peel-back, um, and you can separate little sections. So you can, you know, if, if um, you're going out for uh, an afternoon appointment and then dinner afterwards, you can take out um, lunch and supper sections and not have to carry the entire package with you. And then to the top right section, there are, these are examples of dose sets or pill boxes, sometimes patients know them as. Um, these are often filled by caregivers in their home or sometimes they're given to pharmacies to fill. But recognize that, that not all pharmacies will fill them because it's hard to label them with the necessary information. Um, but my patients who have arthritis in the hands, they tend to like these because it's easy to flip open the, um, the tops of it to, to access the medications. And then on the top side, um, on the left, top left and center, those, these are examples of uh, blister strips. So they're very similar for those who come from a hospital environment. They're very similar to the unit dose packages you find. Uh, the difference here is that each bubble cell contains the medications for one period of time on one particular day. So it might be breakfast on Monday. So instead of one tablet in each package, you would see all the medications needed for breakfast on Monday. And typically patients receive about two weeks worth of medications at a time. Some might receive them weekly. And for others who are much more stable on their medications, this interval might be four weeks. So my time as a home care pharmacist, it really, you know, it really opened my eyes to the different situations under which patients are living and really trying their best to manage their medications. 
I want you to meet Mrs. C. She was one of my um, one of my patients, and um, she's an older lady who lives in the community alone in her own home. And she was referred to me about concerns about her. she had questions about her medications, and she uses medications for diabetes, for blood pressure, for arthritis. And I was told her medications medications were blister packed by her pharmacy. So I want you to remember, Mrs. C. We'll come back to her at the end of the presentation. In these next couple of slides, I want to share what I've learned from patients and their caregivers, as well as other healthcare providers about compliance aids. Patients tell me that they really just want a simple way to take their medications because it allows them to be less dependent on their own family or on other caregivers. They want to be independent, and that's really important to them. It also provides an ability for, for the family or caregivers to also check in to make sure everything is going as planned. But because of the more frequent dispensing of the medications, for some patients, this could mean an additional cost, and it depends on the pharmacy. And as well as you'll see in the upcoming slides, some, some find the compliance packaging difficult to use. Now, from a, a provider perspective, you know, really, when you, we know that patients have different specialists prescribing medications to them, and the regimen can be quite it can become quite complex very quickly, and one of the key positives um, with looking at patients for compliance packaging is the opportunity to simplify the medication regimen. Another also is, and I touched upon this in the previous slide, is the ability to monitor, monitor adherence, and this is actually quite difficult in the community setting. It's much more difficult than in long-term care or in, in hospital. And one way to do this is by implementing something called a take-back program, where the used compliance packaging, whether it be a blister pack or a dose set, it's brought back to the pharmacy for, for pharmacy staff to check on. And some of the cons include an opportunity to introduce error. So each time a medication is manipulated means another opportunity to introduce error. So compliance packaging is really no different. It's a complex process. And it, it, it places additional cognitive workload onto pharmacy staff. And for, for medications that get changed mid-cycle, for some pharmacies, they, they need to conduct what we, we kind of term and um, use, it. We, we say it's surgery. We have to conduct surgery on the existing blister pack or provide medication in vials, and this can often create confusion for the patient. So I purposely put my bullet points in this particular slide so you couldn't read it, because this is how I felt walking to my patient's uh, home. This is Mrs. T's home, and this is her shag carpeting. And this is how I felt stepping over her shag carpeting. There are medications under her sofa, in the basket, under her walker, all over the shag carpeting. I could feel it under my feet. And Mrs. T said she had problems opening up the blister packages on the medicate, and when she tried, the medications would go flying. So she'd try and press out the blisters from the plastic side, and they'd go flying when she couldn't, um, when she tried to put in a force behind it. And then when she, when they did land somewhere, she couldn't find them because of her vision. And and then not only that, after I had a chance to actually sit down and talk to her, it was apparent to me that she really wasn't a good candidate for blister packaging. Um, she couldn't tell me the time of day or the day of week. We tried all these different um, strategies to help her with that. And, and while cognitive limitations are often a reason to package a person's medications, for Mrs. T, it really was not a manageable option. So really, who are good candidates for compliance aids? So patients with multiple medications often find it difficult to manage their medications, especially if the regimen is complex. And complexity is often added by unusual dosing schedules. So sometimes we'll see prescriptions for a warfarin every other day, um, alternating with a different dose every other day, or a methotrexate once a week. That adds complexity to a patient's regimen, even if they're only on two or three medications. So patients really, they find it helpful when the medication is already packaged on the right day at the right time. Um, those individuals you might see consistently come in for early or late refills might be the ones that you might have a chat with um, to see if, if maybe compliance packaging is an option for them. Um, individuals who don't, don't always remember to take their medication or, or patients with visual impairments that might cause them to pick the wrong medication or even those who have difficulty opening up multiple vials a day to access their medications might come, 
might benefit from compliance packaging. But remember, in, in any one of these situations, somebody, whether it's, it's the patient or, or a caregiver, some, somebody needs to be able to identify the correct package or cell or blister from which to take the medication and also have the physical ability to open the right cell to access the, those medications. So let's get back to Mrs. C. So I actually started asking her some questions about her medications. I first started by reviewing her blister pack, and at first glance, everything looked like it was in, in order, all the empty pockets and all the right dates and times. So when I started asking her some open-ended questions, you know, I started with, so Mrs. C, tell me how you take this metformin. Everything looked good, sounded right. Tell me how you take this blood pressure medication. Well, I, I don't take it because it doesn't make me feel very good. It makes my stomach hurt. And so I went on throughout her medications, each of them, and so out of her six or seven medications, she was actually only using metformin and some occasional acetaminophen to help with the arthritis pain. So my question to her was, well, what do you do with all these medications you don't take? Your blister package, you know, the, the empty ones look perfect. So we went into her kitchen. She said, let's go to my kitchen. Well, I walked in, and this is what I saw. So this is not the exact picture because I, I didn't actually take a picture of it at the time. But it was, it was a large vase. These were M&Ms, but these, it was a large vase filled with all her medications that she discarded. I can only guess it was probably about nine months to a year's worth of medications. And she, you know, everything she didn't take, she just popped into her vase and, and continued about her day. So later that day, I stopped by to talk to her pharmacist just to let him know what I discovered, and he, he, really, he really didn't believe me. He said, our, our driver picks up the empty packs every couple of weeks when we drop off the due ones. We've been checking all these months. They've been checking her blister packs, but they weren't checking with her. So that's, that's the key difference here. So really, who are patients who are not the best candidates for blister packaging? So Mrs. Mrs. C, who intentionally omits her medications because they either don't make her feel very good or she doesn't feel she needs them, or, and, and, and somebody who might self-adjust their, their own doses, or Mrs. T, who has significant cognitive impairment, who can't tell the time of day or, or the day of the week, and, and who is also physically unable to use the compliance package. These are patients who are not great candidates for, for this particular intervention. So you met a couple of my patients. Um, one was the wrong candidate. One was on the surface a, the right candidate, but not um, not really the right candidate based on um, what we've now found out about her. So you know, really as healthcare providers, when we address adherence issues, compliance packaging is not going to be the answer for everybody. For some patients, it's it's it, it works wonders, um, but for others, it doesn't. It doesn't. So remember that it tackles patient and therapy factors and doesn't tackle other issues such as cost and, and um, some other um, aspects that we highlighted on the earlier slide. For the right patient, it's very helpful, like I said. Um, and the decision to, to pack or not to pack has to be a joint one with the patient and caregiver. So if you do set up a patient with compliance packaging, you need to make sure you check in to see how they're managing after the first few days and then periodically thereafter. Ask the right questions and then you'll get the, question, you'll get the answers that you, that you need. Thanks, Dorothy. Very interesting cases and great points for community pharmacies to ensure that the right patients are selected for compliance packaging. And so we're actually optimizing their med safety and not hindering it. So uh, the, you've already summarized the key points really well, so I'll go straight into the reflective med safety exercise. Um, how do you assess if a patient will truly benefit from compliance packaging? So are there criteria that you use or is it a gut feeling? And in particular, how can you determine red flags that make you believe compliance packaging may not be the right approach for this patient? And secondarily, how do you know your patient is managing the compliance pack and if it's truly helping them? And have you ever received a number of partially completed compliance packs from a family member or ever thought that a patient might actually be better off without one, or that they need far more assistance than a compliance pack can offer. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on this and your story, so please share them in the comment box or even uh, you know, emailing them to us from our MedSafety Exchange website. 
And these are just some references that Dorothy used. I'd now like to invite our second speaker to describe research findings on diversion of controlled drugs. And even though this was done in the hospital setting, it is a ubiquitous problem, and I know that long-term care homes and community-based care sites can identify with this as well. Thanks, Amica. So, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mark Fan, and uh, I'll be telling you a little bit about the research that I and several others have been doing on this topic. Uh, just as a warning, I'm calling from a hospital, so if I get an overhead page, I might just mute my line for a moment so that you all don't get uh, the full announcement. So if that happens, I'll let you know. But uh, without further ado, let's move forward. I thought I'd give you just a little bit of background on the study. It's funded by BD Canada, and the work was done by two teams, that's Human Era and North York, uh, sorry, Human Era and ISMP Canada. Uh, Human Era is a human factors research team based at the University of Toronto and North York General Hospital. For those of you who haven't heard of human factors before, you can think of it as a discipline that stands at the intersection of psychology, engineering, and design. So uh, contrary to some of the things you may have heard where people say, oh, it was a, it was a human factor, there was a human factor involved in, in that incident, we're really not focused on trying to change people, but trying to understand the circumstances, the technologies, the physical environments, all the things that, um, that we work with as people that can predispose our behavior in one direction or another. And uh, so it, poor design can actually predispose us to error and, and things of that nature. So that's our team. Uh, we're also working very closely with the uh, Institute for Safe Medication Practices Canada on this project. I'm sure you're all familiar with them since they're one of the hosts of the webinar today. Um, and it's a really good partnership for us because our team is primarily psychologists, engineers, and uh, health service researchers, and they can provide the clinical uh, experience that will help us understand various clinical settings. Um, the topic for today is diversion, and I thought I'd start with the definition that we use, and it's really the transfer of medications from legitimate medical use to non-medical use of some sort. So that could be recreational use or drug trafficking. Uh, and we're certainly not the only ones interested in this topic. Uh, drug diversion has been talked about in the media. So there's two articles here from 2017 where um, Health Canada data on opioid losses from Canadian hospitals was described. Uh, there's two other articles here from 2018, and of course there's some in 2019 as well. So I'm not trying to be comprehensive with the, with the news articles, I just want you to have a sense that Given the ongoing opioid crisis, this is a topic that does pop up in the news. And some of the useful data that comes from those news articles is the access to information requests that they make to Health Canada. So when you make those requests to Health Canada, you can get a list of all the controlled drug losses that have been reported to them. Uh, and that's actually quite helpful for us because it gives us a sense of uh, what types of issues we're experiencing in the healthcare system. Uh, when you look at the Health Canada data, there's two categories that uh, are of particular interest to us. There's diversion, and so that includes categories like armed robbery, which is common in community pharmacies, uh, break and enter, grab, theft, uh, and pilferage. Um, and then there's also another category called unexplained losses, and that's just a category by itself. Uh, some of the reports are just tagged with that, and that's really where uh, controlled drugs go missing, but we don't have a clear explanation for it. Uh, and that's troubling for a variety of reasons. Uh, before we get too far down that road, I thought I'd just make a quick distinction here, because all the data that we're talking about that's from Health Canada is what's been reported. Let's be clear that there's also um, what we detect, and that, that may not be exactly the same. We might not report everything that uh, we detect. And it's also possible we don't detect everything that's actually lost. So these, these could be three separate phenomena. Um, our suspicion is that most of what's detected is reported, but we're probably under-detecting what's actually lost. And we don't know to what degree, but you know, we think this for a couple of reasons. Uh, if you look at the literature, there are various examples of, um, of us recognizing that we're not catching everything that we, we possibly could. So in this particular study, in a four-week period, there was more in-depth tracking of propofol in a particular, I think it was an endoscopy clinic. And uh, when the records were reviewed more closely, we could see that $10,000 of 
propofol wasn't accounted for. It just it wasn't the numbers weren't matching up between what was ordered, dispensed, administered, and and wasted or, or disposed of. And so that's just one drug in one clinic. So you could imagine that if we expanded that type of in-depth tracking to multiple drugs, multiple clinics, and of course hospitals across the country, that could become a rather sizable amount of unaccounted for drug. Um, there are other instances in the U.S. where hospitals have been investigated and, and fined for not being compliant with best practices. Now, the reason this is interesting is because, oh, and just let me go back for a moment here. That's not to say that all these drugs um, that were unaccounted for are necessarily diverted. It's just to say that um, we don't have a, a clear trace of, traceable log of where they were and um, when they were accessed and so on. And so that really complicates your ability, if diversion were to occur, to go back and trace what happened. Um, so that's, that's one of the, the key things that we'll talk about in a few more slides. And if you look at the Health Canada data, if you have uh, records that are probably um, lacking some of the detail that you need, they might end up as this huge category you can see on the slide here as unexplained losses. And um, one of our hypotheses is that the mechanisms that you would use to explain a loss, which is you know, very good traceable records, those are probably the same mechanisms you would use to detect a loss. So if the record keeping is hard to follow, it's also going to be hard to detect um, what's actually being lost. So if you think of those three circles that I showed you earlier, um, the fact that unexplained losses are so high is suggestive that we're not able to, to really see what's going on in the biggest circle. Uh, I also want to just place a caveat here because although the focus of our research was in hospitals, we are analyzing some of the Health Canada data ourselves. And what we're seeing so far is that community pharmacies uh, really lose the, the largest share of the drugs reported to Health Canada. And so um, companies would then be next and then hospitals would come in third. Um, and so, you know, I'm fully acknowledging that there's more research and work that needs to be done in community pharmacies, but there's a couple of reasons why it's still very important to look at hospitals. And that's namely because uh, medication is administered in hospitals and therefore diversion can be closer to the patient and there can be some risks to the patient. Uh, perhaps the most troubling example we've come across in the literature, I'll just describe to you briefly, is when a syringe, let's say a syringe of opioid is prepared for a patient who's heading into a procedure. A, a healthcare worker who intends to, to divert that drug could walk by, take the syringe, self-inject it, refill it with saline, and then put it back into circulation for the patient. And so that has a number of impacts. We can talk about that, uh, we can talk about that next. First, uh, in that particular example, the patient wouldn't receive the medication that they actually need, so um, no inadequate pain relief. The staff member who perhaps self-injected would be impaired and possibly continuing to deliver care, so there's some patient safety risks there as well. And in several instances in the U.S., the staff member who was self-injecting also had hepatitis C, so there were some outbreaks of hepatitis C. Um, in other cases, vials of medication were tampered with, and so there were uh, bacterial outbreaks. And these are, um, you know, these impact a large number of people. And so that moves us to number four, where there, there can be the cost of follow-up care to these patients and costly and time-consuming investigations to really understand what happened. Um, a fifth impact is that the staff that are diverting, they're also at risk of overdose and death. And um, you know, one of the benefits of a strong diversion prevention and detection program is that you might be able to spot these individuals sooner and get them the help they need sooner. So that's another motivation for having a, a strong diversion prevention program. And then finally, number six, if, if you imagine you're coming to work and you suspect that someone in your department is diverting drugs, that's a very uncomfortable situation to walk into particularly when there's shared liability for patient care or some other task or process in the hospital that, uh, that you're partially responsible for. And um, 
you know, certainly that weighs on people's minds and, and that also has negative effects on the staff. So, so for these reasons, I hope I've convinced you that um, drug diversion in hospitals is something that is still something that needs to be looked at, even if it's not the largest contributor to our overall drug losses in Canada. Now, in terms of prevention and detection, as I mentioned in my brief spiel about human factors earlier, we've, we're very interested in how the, um, the environment or the workplace that people work in can influence their behavior. And certainly there's a lot that um, hospitals can do proactively to analyze their medication use process and in a, some sort of systematic fashion configure their technologies, whether it be automated dispensing cabinets or um, their electronic medical records, how they sequence their tasks. All of these things can be looked at to reduce the opportunities for diversion. Um, and really the goal there is to increase the traceability of, of how those medications have been moving throughout the system. Um, and when you have that traceability, you'll have a better uh, chance to explain losses. And, oh, here we go. So I've got a hospital code. I'm just going to mute myself for a moment here. Okay, bear with me. There might be some ringing in the background here. This is uh, an open access article. Anyone can read it. Um, of some work that we've done to look at the literature on this topic. If you manage to read it, uh, there's two tables that I want to draw your attention to. That's table two, which describes um, various facilitators that can make diversion a greater possibility in your institution. And then table three, which is um, safeguards that people have suggested to prevent diversion from happening. In the discussion, there are four principles that really cut across everything that's talked about in Table 2 and Table 3. Um, the clinical documentation is something that I want to talk about briefly. Um, and just because of the ringing, ringing, I'll try to move quickly here so we can move to the next presenter. But uh, you could falsify a verbal order to give you more access to control drugs, and uh, you could also falsify the patient's pain scores so that you could legitimately pocket more drugs than people would be aware of. Uh, in terms of inventory documentation, you could forge signatures or if there's some sort of paper log that people are using to keep track of who has accessed the drug cabinet, that could also be manipulated. And uh, in terms of physical security, Doors could be propped open to secure drug areas so anyone could just walk in and take them. And in terms of access credentials, if I've been moved to a new department but security hasn't updated my access to the old department, I could still go back and access drugs in a place that I shouldn't. So those are things to keep in mind. Moving forward, we'll be publishing some results where we did direct observation of our, by ourselves, where we tried to identify where risks were occurring in the hospital environments, and we'll be publishing that soon, as well as an article summarizing the actual wholesale and street value of the drugs that have been lost according to Health Canada data. And for those of you who are, who are interested, there are new papers emerging. This is a new paper from Quebec that talks about um, their attempts to check their hospital's compliance with best practices for preventing diversion. So I'll stop there and I'll mute myself so that uh, Ambika can take over. Thank you so much, Mark. Very important considerations. We're able to for our colleagues, for our patients. And I think the key learning point here is that we don't have a clear picture of the prevalence of drug diversion from hospitals. And as pointed out, there may be significant underreporting. And those incidents that are reported are most often chalked up to unexplained losses. So we are at the point where we don't even know what we don't know. And I think what we do know from certain high profile events and from the early research like what Mark described is that drug diversion can have significant and widespread impact. 
and um, you know, from Mark and the group from Quebec, there are clearly a myriad of vulnerabilities in the medication use process, and this can be taken advantage of to divert drugs. And of course, the documentation and the physical security of drugs are worthwhile targets that can help improve that situation. And healthcare facilities do require guidance to assess their drug processes against known vulnerabilities and identify safeguards that could improve their capacity to prevent or detect diversion. So as a reflective exercise, um, think about the losses of controlled drugs that were reported to Health Canada. So they do have to re re be reported to Health Canada. So just thinking back at your site, you know, how many did you report in 2018? And even if you're not part of the formal um, reporting process, how many episodes of loss were you involved in or are you aware of? And how many of these events had satisfactory explanations and how many ended up being in that very large group of unexplained losses? And as noted in the presentation, falsified clinical and inventory documentation is a key contributor to diversion. So would that falsified documentation be detectable in your care setting and in a timely manner? And are there any steps that you can maybe take to prevent this? Again, we're very early in the understanding of drug diversion and the responses to it. So please share your thoughts, your insights, and your stories, and you can help us all learn. So we'll now get into the observatory for some quick med safety updates. I'd now like to invite our next speaker to provide information on the educational materials that will be available soon to support Vanessa's Law, Mandatory Reporting of Serious ADRs and MDIs to Health Canada. Great. Thank you, Ambika. This is Sylvia Highland from ISMP Canada, and thank you for the opportunity to share briefly an update about educational support for mandatory reporting of serious adverse drug reactions and medical device incidents. So the, um, the purpose of the Protecting Canadians from Unsafe Drugs Act, and this is also known as Vanessa's Law, is to collect more post-market safety information on drugs and medical devices. <clears throat> and with this law, Health Canada has greater authorities to require reporting, authorities to take increased actions when risks due to drugs or devices are identified, and also for transparency of information. So ISP Canada has been working with Health Canada, Health Standards Organization, and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute to create educational materials that are focused on the regulations for the mandatory reporting of serious adverse drug reactions and medical device incidents by hospitals, and the aim is to raise awareness. So within the next two weeks, there will be downloadable PowerPoint slides with key messages and core content. And these slides are designed such that um, they can be used for individual learning and also for someone to select content or slides or images and integrate them into their own presentation template if they like. So to give a few examples, Hospitals could include content um, in lunch and learn presentations. They could also include the information um, about their own uh, processes, procedures, and supporting systems and take that information that they use in their organization and combine it with information that we share around key messages around the regulations for mandatory reporting. Educators can use the content and add it into a curriculum. Um, we're encouraging professional associations, societies, and regulatory colleges to use the content as they like and embed, for example, the content in their various educational programs that might include continuing education or certification programs. And also, we're encouraging patient and consumer organizations to use the content or slides and key messages to help increase awareness of the value of reporting and the expectations around uh, mandatory reporting of adverse drug reactions and medical device incidents. So to give you a visual, the next slide shows you the four modules and what they all contain. So there'll be four modules. The first one provides an overview of Vanessa's Law and the reporting requirements. 
the second module of slides um, describes the reporting processes and mechanisms and various definitions for submission to Health Canada. The third module, it provides various strategies that have been um, put in place across the country and gives examples of how to promote and support reporting in your organization. And the fourth module shares information about Health Canada's role, their review and communication of safety findings, how they share information, including links to their online databases. And just to give a small example, if an individual wanted to share a five-minute update at a meeting about the, about the regulations, they could pick and choose one or two slides from each of the modules suited to their audience. And, and you know, various audience might include health, uh, hospital leadership, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, maybe technicians, maybe students patients, the health records department. So depending on the audience that we're, we're raising awareness to, might be different slides, different messages that we pick when we put, pull together this information. So just wanted to share with you a little bit about how that could work. The next slide. The next slide is, is letting you know that the modules are coming soon. They will be on the Canadian Patient Safety Institute website, and the link is here. And we're really trying to get the word out that organizations can use these slides to prepare for the regulations that do come into effect December 2019. I can give one, one other example. We are beginning to work with Patients for Patient Safety Canada to select slides and create a focused patient family consumer friendly version of this information. Patients for Patient Safety Canada plans to share their version as well. And so um, maybe my, my ending message is to encourage any of you, if you're working or representing an organization, we encourage you to see if these slides are useful to you to help raise awareness about this important um, uh, and the right thing to do work, which is reporting. And um, please do not hesitate to contact us if you would like assistance or guidance in how to use this information to help spread the word. And uh, that's it, Andika. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sylvia. Looking forward to uh, seeing those final products. I'd now like to have uh, CPSI give us an update on their med safety initiatives. Um, two updates from CPSI uh, this morning. First is on a uh, public opinion poll uh, that was completed by Patients for Patient Safety Canada in late 2018 uh, in support of Health Canada's plain language labeling regulations for non-prescription health products. Um, they complete the survey uh, on the, with the public on the issue to better understand the challenges with reading and understanding over-the-counter health products. Uh, the survey indicated uh, that consumers are sometimes confused when pur purchasing self-care products and raises some potential concerns regarding harm. Uh, namely, are people choosing the wrong product because of confusion and thereby increasing their risk of harm? Uh, CPSI and Patients for Patient Safety Canada uh, continue to support this important work uh, by Health Canada to ensure medication safety. And for more information on the survey, please feel free to reach out to CPSI. And for more information on the plain language labeling regulations and related initiative, please visit Health Canada's website. The second update I have today is uh, an exciting one for patient safety. Um, member states meeting at the 72nd World Health Assembly uh, in May in Switzerland committed to recognizing patient safety as a key global health priority and to take uh, concerted action to reduce patient harm in healthcare settings. Uh, so at this assembly, they endorsed and have officially announced the establishment of a annual World Patient Safety Day which will occur on September 17th and annually every year on September 17th. Uh, and they have called on the WHO to provide technical support to all their member states and countries uh, to build national capacities to assess, measure, and improve patient safety. Uh, this is a monumental moment for patient safety as there are a limited number of health days. Uh, so it's an important step to recognizing and keeping patient safety at the forefront as a global health priority. Uh, CPSI, as a designated WHO collaborating center, uh, will be working directly with the WHO in planning for this day. Uh, so I'd encourage everyone on the line to please follow us on our social media platforms and visit our website as we'll have some more information coming soon. Thanks and back to you, Ambika. 
Great, thank you for both those updates. Uh, I'm actually very interested in labeling and packaging as a contributing factor to med errors. So that survey of consumers is particularly illuminating. Um, so thank you again to all our speakers for the excellent learning shared today. Uh, we will be getting to the questions that we've been receiving throughout the webinar so that our presenters have a chance to elaborate. We are running a little bit behind, so if we aren't able to get to all your questions, we will try to reach out by email to answer them. I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, uh, Ambika, and thank you to everybody. Um, our first question is for um, our compliance packaging um, uh, presentation. Um, an interesting question related to technology. Um, do you think we could leverage more technology to accompany compliance packs? And this respondent says, like, have uh, Google Home or Alexa remind patients to take medications from their packaging, or even, as they suggest, a some sort of micro-automated dispensing cabinet in the home that would dispense these medications. Thanks for the question, Mike. Um, it's Dorothy. Um, yeah, nowadays there's so many different technology um, options available um, to to folks. Um, products like Google Home, there that's easily set up to create reminders throughout the day. Um, there's an app for everything now. Looking for like really a really basic app that might simply just include some security, um, an ability to personalize and set reminders, um, rather than a complex app is, is, uh, is ideal. Um, there's products like um, special vials that might have some technology in the lid that recognizes when the vials have been opened. But the one thing that I, I just want to caution is I, I, I don't want to see an over-reliance in technology setting up these products and going, okay, mom, you're all set up. I expect you to be able to take your medications. I think we still need to recognize that we need, we, we need to check in with the patient. Um, you know, is, is your mom like Mrs. C who discards her medications? Um, there might be some additional safety concerns, like if you have the, this micro ADC in the home, I don't know if one exists. Um, at the time I was practicing, that, that wasn't available, but certainly it might be now. But safety concerns such as, you know, if the medications drop out of the, the, um, the unit um, and the patient doesn't remember to take it, and then going back at, at a later time and seeing double doses there. So those are all concerns that we need to sort of weigh before determining if these technology interventions um, are the right thing for the right patient. And I'll follow that up with uh, a question from the field. Um, currently, um, the uh, OCP uh, requires a pharmacist to conduct a therapeutic review of patient medication every three months. Is this a mandatory requirement for the registered pharmacist to conduct a direct review with a patient? So I'm not aware if there is a requirement or not to conduct a direct review with the patient. Um, and I'm not familiar with all the different expectations from all the different jurisdictions, but uh, as you can see with my two patients that I highlighted, um, not having that direct conversation with the individual only really gives you a partial picture of what's happening in the home. It's it, Like I said, it was really eye-opening for me. So without doing that, you're going to be making therapeutic decisions based on incomplete information. So whether it's a requirement or not, um, I would highly encourage having that conversation. And uh, finally, a related question for you, Dorothy. In a number of cases, we get orders for compliance packaging from the hospital or home care to be picked up by a family member or a guardian, or in other words, no face-to-face -face contact with the patient, and we can't really talk to the patient. And the patient or the person picking up the medications can't really answer all the questions. I think that hospitals and home care, um, they present compliance packaging as a kind of panacea to patients and families, but as you point out, there are a lot of complexities involved. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to approach this? No, that's a, it's a good question. A lot of the individuals who um, 
may not be able to actually get to the pharmacy to to speak with the pharmacist. I know in, in some jurisdictions there was an opportunity, I don't know if those opportunities still exist, for for, for pharmacists to get into the home um, to be able to just check in and, and see if the, if the compliance packaging is going as intended. Um, in terms of like compliance packaging trying to be set up from, from hospitals or other other areas of the healthcare system, um, Sometimes you need some a little bit behind the scenes work, checking checking in with you know the community firms to see what types of products are available, and then maybe creating a screening process so that um, you're not getting the wrong patients going through the compliance packaging process. But it's um it's 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 tough. It's tough, and and I you know wherever you can, I highly encourage that opportunity to speak with the patient. Um, thanks, Dorothy. And uh, as I understand now, uh, Mark is available to speak with us. Uh, the crisis at Northrop General is is over, thankfully. And um, Mark, uh, if you're there, I'll start off with two related questions. I think um, the first one is: um, data suggests hospital diversion is not the largest contributor, but is there a sense of the numbers and the safety risks are quite concerning? And the second related question is, do you think that drug diversion from hospitals is mainly episodic large-scale diversions like 2,000 tablets at once, or is it a continuous loss of smaller numbers like two to three tablets of Percocet a day? And it strikes this person that the responses uh, to the diversion may be different in both of these cases. Yes, the crisis is over. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, in terms of the first question, like what are the numbers, I can only comment on the data set that we've been looking at more closely recently, and that was a data set that covers 2012 to September 2017. So in that data set, we converted all the losses into milligrams and then oral morphine equivalents. And so farm, community pharmacies were responsible for about over 76% of all the uh, controlled drug losses that we analyzed. We were only focused on five opioids, uh, codeine, fentanyl, hydromorphone, morphine, and oxycodone. Certainly if we included benzodiazepines and the other controlled drugs, um, maybe there would be some sort of shift. But um, yeah, based on those five opioids, uh, farm, community pharmacies were at 76%, companies were at around 17 and then hospitals were at 6%. So that's to give you a sense of scale. Um, and the second question was uh, like large losses versus a steady stream of smaller losses. I just took a quick look through the data set and I think it's a, it's a mixture. Uh, there's certainly some line items here which show a big loss, uh, but the legislation suggests that you're supposed to report a loss within 10 days. And so I also see quite a few reports here that are three tablets, five tablets, 10 tablets, uh, I think it really just depends on how the institution keeps track of these things and, and how diligent they are at, at spotting them. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, th thanks very much, Mark. I'll now turn it over uh, to Ambika for uh, closing. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, sorry, I'm going to just power through the last couple of slides here. I do want to um, bring our attention again to the excellent suggestions that we have for topics throughout the year. So please reach out if you have anything to share. Um, we can help you develop a presentation around it. It could be as short as five minutes if you'd like. Um, but we really want to, again, you know, share the learning as much as possible. And we do want everyone to be part of the Med Safety Exchange, so whether it's an incident analysis or a med safety initiative, please email us, even if the topic isn't on that previous list. And please don't forget to fill out the poll that's available on the right side of your screen. And as a reminder, the questions will be different each time, so please take an extra moment to read through them. And the link to the recording of this webinar will be available on the Med Safety Exchange website next week, along with any resources provided by the presenters. And a PDF of the slides is available upon request if you just email the address on the slide. So registration for the next webinar on Wednesday, September 18th is now open, so you can head over to the website to sign up. Thank you again to our speakers for the important analyses and strategies and learning shared today, and to all of our participants for joining the discussion and um, having some really great insightful questions. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and we'll see you in two months. Bye for now.